Hi, this is Annie Grace, and welcome to this Naked Mind podcast. And I am here with a special guest, Ruby, author of Sober Curious. Welcome, Ruby. So good to have you here. Hi, Annie. It's so good to be here, too. Thank you for having me. So awesome. So I met Ruby because I was on her podcast, and we're like, oh my gosh, this is great. We had such a fun conversation, so much uh, synergy. And I just was like, okay, everybody needs to hear, hear Ruby's story. So I'm going to do what I always do and have you just kind of like, back me way up to the super beginning, like your, your, your first drink, your childhood, where did it all start for you? Okay, right. I haven't gone that far back for a while on a podcast. This is great. <laughs> um, okay, so it's interesting, right? I had two, two pa- one parent who drank a lot and one parent who really didn't ever even think or talk about alcohol. My parents separated when I was just one year old and I was raised mainly by my mom, who was a seeker in many ways and wounded in many ways and, you know, looking to medicate in some ways, I suppose, but alcohol was just not something she ever kind of really engaged with, maybe a glass of wine here and there. So the messaging I got from her was very much about like, we heal through therapy, we heal through food. Like she was seeking all these kind of alternative ways back in the 1970s, which were a little bit kind of out there, I suppose to heal herself and her own wounds. And she wasn't, you know, she wasn't necessarily running away from things with alcohol. And on the other hand, my dad lived this very kind of urbane lifestyle. He was um, a teacher of architecture at the university in London and alcohol was very much a part of his world. He wasn't, I wouldn't say that he was like an alcoholic drinker necessarily. It wasn't ever perceived as problematic in those ways. And yet it was kind of ever present, you know, there were lots of dinner parties at our house. I do remember on a few occasions, like, where's dad? Oh, he's fallen asleep on the sofa, but it wasn't ever anything that was kind of perceived as a problem or bad. And I guess, so I wasn't necessarily, I was neither that excited about drinking or that kind of repulsed by the idea of it. It wasn't, it didn't have a huge presence in my world. And the first time I remember getting drunk, well, actually let's back up. So that said, you know, those dinner parties with my dad, he, they were very much of the like, um, the open-minded perspective that a sip of wine here and there was probably a good idea because I wouldn't necessarily hold it on a pedestal and it wouldn't be something that I really wanted to, um, that I fetishized in any way as a, as a teenager and kind of wanted to, to be able to partake in as quickly as possible. So it was always kind of like, you know, half a glass of wine topped up with water at dinner, that kind of a dinner table situation at my dad's. Um, And so I was, yeah, I guess I was exposed to alcohol fairly young. And then it wasn't, I guess, like most of us, well, many of us, um, the first time I got drunk or really realized that alcohol could be used to change my experience, Mm -hmm. to alter the way I was being perceived, to alter the way that I was experiencing the world was around age 15, I suppose. I remember quite clearly, actually, we were graduating or finishing up like a bunch of exams. They're called GC- <clears throat> GCSEs in the UK. I don't even know if they still exist. This was a long time ago. <laughs> but our drama, drama teacher for our GCSEs, bear in mind we're like 15, 16, was only 23. And he was quite a rebel. And he liked to tell us in our drama lessons how he got his inspiration through drinking liquid opium. And he seemed kind of super exotic. He was pretty good looking. A lot of the girls had a crush on him. And I remember when we finished like our kind of the, the GCSE drama production, he had bought alcohol for us all. I don't know if, I, I don't know how this happened. I don't know if the school knew about this. I don't remember what happened to him. Like we kind of all graduated and went on to the next level of school after this point. But like looking back, it's kind of pretty out there. But he bought these huge bottles of um, like really strong cider. I don't know if you really get that in the US, but it was a big thing in the UK. It, this kind of like- starting here barely, but like- Right. Because like- I remember when I first moved here, cider is like, oh, it's just like apple juice. So this yeah. is like ha- hard cider. Right. But yeah. imagine hard cider that's kind of like 9% alcohol. So it's pretty intense. And it comes in these big, I'm doing hand gestures, like these big two liter bottles and you can buy it very cheap. So this like hard cider, they called things like white lightning, (laughs) are they're really popular, you know, it's a really cheap and effective way to get drunk quickly. So he bought us a bunch of bottles of this. And I just remember drinking it. And I remember like just running through the schoolyard, feeling so free and feeling so excited about what was going to come from life. I went home with my best friend. I spent a lot of time at her house and stayed at her house that night. And I remember being on the bus 
on the way home and going up to like all these strangers on the bus to her house and like talking to people and chatting away with people on the bus and just feeling so, I think what I felt was a real, a surge of confidence. And the backside of that or the flip side of that being um, the relief that I wasn't necessarily this shy kind of introverted person who had a difficult time communicating with people or a difficult time feeling confident. Whoa, what a relief. I'm not that. I can be this confident extroverted, I, what I perceived as ideal you know, in a, at that age. And so, yeah, definitely it's a memory that's really kind of stayed with me that first time of getting drunk. But it wasn't like I dove into heavy drinking straight away. Um, it became a part of my life. There were some more expensive kind of classy versions of that cider, which, you know, as we became old enough to get them, I would use, but actually it wasn't long until I met, um, my first kind of long-term boyfriend when I was 16 and he was a big, big weed smoker, weed dealer like it was his whole world he was one of those guys who like would make twice a year trips to Amsterdam and like totally fetishize the whole kind of cultivation side of weed culture and he was really really anti-alcohol oh and you get those kind of people who are like weed is the answer to all of society's problems and alcohol is just evil and that kind of like conspiracy theory sort of mentality he was like that and so he yeah he was also extremely emotionally controlling and um essentially banned me from drinking alcohol. So I didn't then drink alcohol from the age 16 to 22, 21, 22, when I wow. left him. So I had a huge break all the way through college. I didn't drink at all. Um, but and I mean, this is stuff that I talk about in my book, Sober Curious. I also developed an eating disorder during that time. I was smoking weed every day, even though I didn't enjoy it. It was just something that we did. And it was kind of like expected of me as his girlfriend. It was not a, not a very, it was not a good time. Right. Mm. So as much as I wasn't drinking, it's not to say that I wasn't using other kind of like methods of escape from the discomfort and the pain that I was experiencing in my life. And it was only really like looking back literally as I was writing, well, I, I wrote about it in my first book slightly, but, um, while I was writing Sober Curious and actually really kind of like writing out the, the chain of events, I realized that my heavy, my alcohol use and what became quite heavy alcohol use coincided absolutely with me leaving this guy and getting out of this relationship. And I really did use it. Like, like I said, I didn't drink while I was in college and um, all of my friends did. <laughs> and one friend in particular could see that this, this relationship was very damaging for me and was really kind of encouraging me to leave him to free myself from that situation. And I would, I started drinking with her a glass of wine here, you know, a couple of beers after class there. And I began to feel again that alcohol or believe that alcohol was giving me this confidence, which I didn't necessarily possess within myself. And essentially it was like, I went on vacation with this friend, much to his disgust when we finished our college degree. Um, we went on holiday and drank heavily throughout the entire holiday. And I wound up, you know, sleeping with some guy on this holiday. And for me, that was the perfect excuse to leave the ex because I knew that um, none of this is, is a behavior that I'm particularly proud of. But at the time it was a real, you know, I, I was able to come back from that vacation and tell him I cheated on him. So he kicked me out. And that was the end of that relationship and the beginning of my relationship with alcohol as this kind of like trusty crutch that would give me confidence, that would free me to be who I quote unquote really was. Um, and yeah, then went into um, a career in magazine journalism in the UK, which is, it's a very boozy industry. I mean, it's similar. You come from marketing background. They're kind of like interlinked industries in a way. And just a lot of the socializing that happens in those circles is very alcohol heavy. And so, yeah, it just became very much a part of my personality um, in terms of my career and who I was career wise. So it's kind of a, pot, a potted history. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so, so you were, uh, that just of course has to bring to mind Bridget Jones diary because I just imagine. Like, <laughs> the yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, I mean, she, for people who are unfamiliar, you know, the, um, those books by Helen Fielding kind of satirized the idea of this like independent, although she's not particularly independent or feminist, but she's by, not by choice necessarily, but, you know, woman who, for whom alcohol is um, a passport to glamour, a passport to 
being confident with men, a passport to being sexually attractive. And those are all things that I also leaned on alcohol for during my 20s as I came out of that very damaging relationship. Bear in mind, age 16 to 22, so much of my development as a woman had been stunted. And I didn't really know how to behave as a as a sexual being. I didn't really know how to behave in my body. I was recovering from an eating disorder. And that's something else that I've heard, and I'm sure you're, you're familiar with this too, but that actually eating disorders and alcohol abuse are very, very linked. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is something I hadn't really, no, I hadn't really realized that actually I just replaced that one coping mechanism with the alcohol, pretty much literally one door closing, another door opening as I left that relationship. That's so interesting. And how, how do you feel like, like what, what very practically have you done now to, to kind of overcome that specifically, you know, in, in the sense of like not feeling comfortable in your own skin? And do you feel like then once you stop drinking, you've had to do all this work to really get to a point where you're comfortable? Or was it really that you just sort of recognized, oh, well, I was anyway, and I just didn't know this, but. Well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> kind of how long have you got? It's interesting when I moved, um, I moved to New York eight years ago and that kind of coincided with my whole getting sober curious and really beginning to examine my relationship to drinking because as much as I was drinking regularly and at times heavily, it still, I was going to say it wouldn't ever have been classed problem drinking because my drinking didn't look like what we perceive of as alcoholic drinking or problem drinking. Like I never drank for more than two nights in a row. Um, I never had blackouts. Like I just never, I never got sick from drinking. I never lost a job. Like all of, you know, all of the kind of markers of like what's problem drinking, I wasn't experiencing. Plus, as I now know as well, living away from the UK, like drinking is so interwoven into the everyday culture there that what actually is very heavy habitual drinking is completely, completely normalized. And I wasn't drinking nearly as much as many of my peers, for example. That doesn't mean that we weren't all still drinking a lot (laughs) and to excess, you know. Um, But I began to really question even the kind of like drinking that I was doing probably about nine years, about a year before we moved to New York. And this was as a result of just feeling like a real dead end in my life, even though I'd achieved so many things that I wanted to, like I'd had a super successful career in journalism um, since, you know, leaving college and, and launching myself into that world. And I had this job that I really loved. I was in a great relationship by this point. I owned a home in a great area, had fabulous friendships. And yet I felt deeply dissatisfied and was grappling really pretty much constant anxiety and this constant sense of imposter syndrome or this constant idea that like everything I had worked towards was built on quicksand and that it could all just disappear at any moment if I didn't kind of like keep up appearances and keep up the work that I was doing. So just a really unstable time. And I began to notice that inevitably if I was hung over or in any way used alcohol to kind of escape those feelings, they would come back 10 times worse the next day. And it just became harder and harder to ignore the link between my drinking and my overall sense of just dis-ease and anxiety mm-hmm. and displacement within my own life. And so I just, I know I really began to question it. And it was a very internal kind of questioning in the beginning because I thought that if I questioned it, externally people would tell me I was an alcoholic and I had to go to AA and I would have to quit drinking and I didn't want to do that overnight. It was a confusing time, I suppose. Um, But then I moved to New York about a year after that happened. And with that kind of left my old career behind pretty much and was able to begin enacting or putting into place an idea or working on an idea that I'd had for a online magazine that kind of investigated all aspects of modern spirituality. And that's what became my online platform, The Numinous. Again, this was, you know, in a sense of, in a response to a a period of seeking or a process of seeking some bigger, some deeper answers that I'd embarked on, along with seeking answers around alcohol and the overall impact that it was really having on my well-being. I was really kind of getting interested in like, well, what am I here for? What is the meaning of life? Like all of those big things, like what's the purpose for all of this? What am I actually working towards? Is the work that I'm doing contributing anything value in the world? And so 
looking for answers to those questions had led me back into a study of astrology, which I'd always been fascinated by, and into looking at all sorts of different mystical, spiritual traditions. And what I realized was there wasn't really a hub or a place I could learn about these things um, that kind of relayed them, re made them relevant to modern life. And so the numinous was my attempt at creating that kind of a hub. And what happened is I began working on this project and threw myself into a study of many of these subjects, um, including all sorts of different um, emotional and mental wellness techniques and modalities. And this became the backdrop, well, my, my, my slowly moving further and further away from alcohol and actually answering the bigger questions I had about alcohol, which were, why do I need this to feel confident? Why do I expect that, you know, this is going to solve all of my problems? Why have I blindly gone along with this drinking culture, even though I know that there are so many negative side effects? Those questions began to be answered through my exploration of all things numinous. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a two whole, twofold thing, right? For me, alcohol had largely been tied up with socializing and feeling confident in social situations. That was the main reason on the surface mm -hmm. that I used it, as I'm sure many people can relate to, right? There was social anxiety or I didn't, or I was more introverted than our society would expect me to be, et cetera. Um, and so what happened was I'd find myself going instead of bars and parties, I'd find myself going to moon circles and healing sessions and breathwork sessions and sharing circles and all of these things that I was engaging with for research for my project. And in doing so, I was finding a whole community or connecting to a whole community of people who just weren't really interested in drinking, where alcohol was just pretty much off the table. It wasn't being offered in these settings. People weren't talking about it. People weren't using it. And at first that was quite jarring to me. It was like, what do you mean none of you drink? Like, don't you miss it? Like, was it hard to quit? And people were just like, oh, I just don't ever really think about it. And this to me was, huh, who are you? What's going on here? But slowly, slowly over time, I began to get used to socializing without alcohol being there and realizing that actually this is fine, particularly if I'm in a setting where it's okay for me to talk about what's really going on for me, particularly if I'm in a setting where we're going to be collaborating on a kind of a group activity where we can all lift each other up like this feels like the kind of socializing I can definitely get on board with and then the flip side to that was that I was also through some of the healing modalities I was being exposed to and experimenting with actually starting to address some of the deeper seated insecurities cause reasons for my insecurity reasons for my lack of confidence some of the much more you know uncomfortable feelings around my parents divorce around all the sorts of things that had just been shoved under the carpet, even the kind of like ancestral stuff that I was still, I was becoming aware that I was carrying for each of my parents, like just looking at those deeper things that were at play, um, that I had also, I began to realize, been using alcohol as a way to not confront, to not look at, to not work on, you know? Mm -hmm. So I had this, the, so start moving to New York, starting starting the Numinous had this two-pronged approach of giving me new ways to socialize, and helping me heal and find tools for actually integrating and look at some of that deeper emotional stuff. And as a result, I no longer needed alcohol. So many of the things I was looking for in alcohol, I had other ways to access and experience. And so it became, it became I think, a very, um, the path that I walked, which is kind of what I talk about and guide people through in Sober Curious, became what feels to me now like almost 10 years on a really sustainable approach to quitting drinking <laughs> because like i just said i no longer quote unquote need alcohol for anything i've found other ways to experience and access all the things i was using it for no that's so awesome so why would i use it you know yeah. <laughs> absolutely that's great that's such a cool thing and what does numinous mean exactly so numinous, the word was first used, um, an astrologer, a very eminent astrologer in the UK who was mentoring me back in the beginning, um, used that word in conversation. And I just was like, huh, what is that? It's the best word ever. <laughs> and it's spelled like luminous, but with an N. And it's, it me she described it as meaning that which is unknown or unknowable. And for me, it just speaks to anything that comes within the realm of human experience that we can't necessarily define with words. 
feel our deepest feeling states, our intuition, um, our experience of like transcendent other realms, our dream states, all those things are numinous. Oh, very cool. That's so yeah. And I think that a lot of the time with alcohol, we're either fight, looking for a way to interact with those realms when we're looking for some kind of a transcendent experience or experiences, something that feels sort of magical and otherworldly, or we're looking to escape from the pull of those realms. If there's something dark in that numinous part of us that we don't feel like we have the capacity to look at, we can be using alcohol to numb out from it. So again, alcohol, alcohol is a deeply numinous substance in a way. <laughs> yeah, it does all sorts of things that we don't really realize or aren't even aware of. And exactly, exactly. And I think it kind of it activates, it can activate a part of ourself that we are keeping hidden or that is hidden to us, maybe a shadow part of us, you know, like I, I, like I said, I've never really experienced blackouts, but I kind of talk in the book about like, what's really going on there? Is there a part of us that's wanting to be expressed that we maybe have judgments or shame around? So we kind of just, we use alcohol to disable that judging part of our brain so that this, this maybe wilder part of us can come out <laughs> or this subversive part of us can come out, you know? Um, yeah, theories. Interesting. Yeah. I recently saw an interview with Malcolm Gladwell. He was talking about that idea of, um, you know, does alcohol, like we've had this idea that alcohol makes us more of who we really are. Right. And he's like, well, scientifically, that's not actually true. And he had some pretty compelling evidence that alcohol just makes you really myopic. So it makes you really focused on what's right in front of you. Very animalistic. So like what's right in front of me, is it, you know, I mean, we all know that well, maybe not in the UK, but in the US, the 3 a.m. Taco Bell runs after the bars closed at 2 a.m., right? Or, oh, it, it's kebabs. That's what it was. Yeah, we have kebabs. <laughs> the kebab run. <laughs> yeah. Kebab run after, <laughs> after the bars closed. And, and just like stuffing your face with food that you would never normally eat, right? And it's just like, oh, because it's right in front of you. And he said, so actually all it's doing is it's preventing your brain from accessing the more human sides of you that says, oh, this has a consequence. This is going to make me feel bad. And so if he was speaking specifically about something like, you know, um, date rape or sexual abuse in colleges and, and things like that, and how we get into this, this point of being very just in the moment and very tapped into like the very primal animalistic, there's no consequence to this, or mm. there's no part of me that's saying, who am I really? And so actually it doesn't make you more of who you are. It makes you much less of who the, the higher self of you are. Like the most exactly. self of you. Yeah. I've, I've heard him speaking on that too. And it's so interesting. I think he, in the interview I heard, he said, I think of alcohol not as, a, as an agent to inhibition, but an agent to myopia. So yeah, this idea that actually, if you think about how much the human brain and human experience has evolved, the more we've expanded our consciousness, the more that we've learned about what it means to be a human, the more we're asked to interact with people from different cultures and experience a wider um, a wider view on the world, I suppose, we've developed so much and we're so much more aware of the consequences of our actions, not only on ourselves, but on others also. And so, yeah, it seems when you think about alcohol in that way, and you talk about this in your book as well, when you do your, when you do your experiment of drinking and you notice that your vision is getting narrower and narrower and you're just kind of, it feels like the world is closing in on you. And I absolutely experience the same thing now, even if I have one or two sips of alcohol, I really notice that sense of the world getting smaller it feels so regressive, doesn't it? To close down those parts of our brains that we've actually worked so hard individually and as a society to expand and to, to learn. Like, you know, some people would say that our real mission as, as a human race is to better know ourselves and know our impulses and know why we're here and know what it means to be a part of the human race, you know, to close all of that down for the sake of a few hours of quote unquote fun or forgetting just feels so um, basic. Right, right. That's so interesting. It's amazing. So, wow, we went really deep, which is great. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. And it does really answer the question, well, what happened? Like, did you, <clears throat> how did you deal with those feelings at 15 of, of being an introvert and feeling inadequate? And then all of a sudden feeling like alcohol somehow had awakened you to who you really were and, and the journey through that, which is amazing. Um, but let's back up in your story. So you had, you would 
your, your Bridget Jones, for lack of a better. I have Bridget Jones. Right. There you are. <laughs> you're, you're boozing it up in your- Except class. she was single and I'm like a serial monogamous. I went from one really crappy relationship right into one really great relationship, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> so there you are, monogamous Bridget Jones. And, um, yep. and, and so then what happened? Um, what you mean in terms of how did I actually, actually practically start addressing it? Yes. And, and what were sort of the moments where you're like, okay, like this is, you know, worth addressing, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, there was one that really get curious. Yeah. There's one, I mean, I guess the, the curiosity had been there on an almost subconscious level. There was just a sense, a numinous sense of unease Mm. around alcohol and yet no kind of like, um, cognizant kind of capacity or understanding of like why that was, they're just kind of still blindly going along with it because it's like what literally everybody in my world was engaging in. It's just what we did. But I remember, um, I, in my magazine job at the time, I got sent to cover this yoga retreat. This is the kind of amazing cushy job I had that I wasn't happy with and couldn't work out why I wasn't happy with it and all this stuff. But anyway, I got sent to cover a yoga retreat and it was in Ibiza of all places, which you may or may not know is kind of like known as the party capital of Europe. And I had spent many summers there um, getting very drunk, getting very high and having a ball. But it was very much that kind of a hedonistic place. And I went on this yoga retreat and um, it was Kundalini yoga. Are you familiar with Kundalini yoga? Very vaguely. I've never done it myself. I'm curious though, for sure. It's actually a great, a lot of, a lot of, um, I know a lot of people who've had addiction issues find um, it to be very helpful. It can very quickly shift your energy and it can very quickly, um, it can be very enlivening as well. And it kind of gives you a natural high. Um, however, so this is a Kundalini yoga retreat, but it's also very, very strange Like you'll do things like laugh for half an hour or like do all these strange breathing exercises with weird hand movements. And it's very odd. (laughs) So part of it is getting out of your comfort zone as well. It's a kind of destroyer of the ego, let's say, (laughs) because you just have to make yourself look completely weird. Anyway, I was on this, I went on this yoga retreat and there was no alcohol served. And I was there with strangers in Ibiza doing this kind of crazy weird yoga for the whole weekend. And I remember thinking, okay, there's no alcohol, fine. And then on the last night we went out for dinner and again, nobody ordered alcohol. And I was quite antsy at this stage. I was like, we're not on the retreat anymore and we're at dinner and no one's ordering wine. And I was very curious about how strong my desire for a drink was and how obsessively I was thinking about it. It was like, this is interesting. Okay. When it's not there, it appears I am very attached to it, you know, even though I didn't consider myself to be addicted at that point. Um, so that was kind of an interesting point, but the most, the biggest revelation was traveling home that Sunday or whatever, and then going to work the following day and feeling so excited about seeing my colleagues and feeling so, um, just overjoyed that I had this brilliant job and feeling really kind of like, committed to doing a great job that week and really excited about getting into my inbox and like whatever work I had. And I was just like, this is, this is insane. Like the level of um, optimism and enthusiasm and hope that I have (laughs) after a weekend of not drinking. And then I, it, it was very clear. This was the first weekend I hadn't had any alcohol since I was probably like 22, probably in about 12 years. And it was like night and day considering my usual Monday morning was like, here we go again oh, how, what problems are going to have this week? Or like, what's going to come up? Or like, oh my God, I have to listen to so-and-so talk about her weekend again. Oh, how boring, you know? Just the difference in my mindset, it was really, really hard to ignore. So again, it was less the kind of alcohol is causing me these huge problems. I have to stop. Right. And more the, oh, this is how I could feel all the time if I don't drink. Like maybe all of that dissatisfaction I'm feeling with life, maybe all of that lethargy, maybe all of that kind of sense of being trapped is actually a result of this cycle of drinking that I've been engaging in. Whoa, what if on the other side of that is actually this naturally buoyant state of like, an ability and just an ability to enjoy my life as it is. So that's what really planted the seeds of curiosity. It was more about like, how good could life get if I wasn't drinking? And then of course, cue like nine, 10 years of of working that out. And like I said, you know, doing all the realizing that 
yes, of course, alcohol was adding a hugely heavy toxic load to my system and was acting, doing what it does. It's acting as a depressant. And it was also preventing me from looking at some of those deeper wounds, the deeper issues, emotional, the spiritual, mental issues that actually I needed to look at um, so that I could really embody that confident, hopeful, enthusiastic, optimistic self. Yeah, I love that. I love the idea of just like getting curious about the positives, which I, which I know is like the premise of Sober Curious. And it's, it's just such a, a cool thing of like, okay, well, why do we have to, why does it have to be a problem? Why can't it just be a, a deep level of curiosity about like what else is out there and what is this really doing to me and how is it affecting, you know, I like to say this and I, I probably say it far too often, but I, one of the big ahas for me and realizations was that being drunk at a, a sporting event felt the same as being drunk at a, you know, mom's play date felt the same as being drunk at home, watching TV felt the same as being drunk with colleagues felt the same as being drunk on your wedding night. Like they, they all felt the same. So like what I was doing in effect was like taking all my experiences and adding this layer to them. That was like homogenized, 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 same, same, same. Like let's take the, the breadth of a human experience and just like plaster it with something that's going to take everything and make it feel the same. And very much like in that experiment video where, what did it feel like? Well, when I really mm. got so conscious that I was gonna actively go into getting drunk on camera and saying, what does this feel like? It did, it felt like the room got fuzzy, my perceptions, I could feel my senses dulling. I could feel mm -hmm. my awareness of, you know, how you can be aware of noises and feelings and touch and smell. And actually that's such a cool mindfulness technique to like do that. And mm. all of those were, were like coming inward and, and feeling less. And I could feel, um, just like, it's like the edges were, were getting soft. And I was like, huh, yeah, this is what it feels like. And it doesn't necessarily matter what my external circumstances are. And so now, um, and just the curiosity to be like, what would it feel like? And when, when was the last time? I mean, I remember there being alcohol at every funeral I was at, every baby shower I was at. I remember there being a baby shower after I stopped drinking and maybe I was just more aware of it at this point, but they literally had taken the baby bathtub, which was a gift and filled it with beer. Oh my God. <laughs> it's like, just like, wow. Oh, this is, you know. Huh, the symbolism. No. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, which there's a couple of ironies. Well, what, the first thing is like, I, I, I can't remember if you talk about this, but just the sense when I was contemplating the idea of quitting drinking of how boring and how one note life would become if I did that. Because I also associated alcohol with these like amazing highs. Sure, there were crashing lows, but they were worth it for the highs, right? And, but actually what I've realized since is that, yeah, all of those highs were of exactly the same high, again, air quotes, highs were of exactly the same tone texture. Um, and were giving me a very similar experience in all of those different times when I could be experiencing different kinds of highs, the high of connection, the high of laughter, the high of dancing, the high of expressing deep emotional truths that are making me cry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the other thing as well, I think is like, when I think about the positives of not drinking, they're not necessarily, it's not all about like being happy all the time or feeling contented or confident all the time. Like for me, the positives and the highs include feeling really depressed, but knowing exactly why I feel really depressed or, you know, experiencing anxiety and noticing what actually helps to ease that anxiety, the actions that I need to help, that I need to um, enact to really truly kind of address my anxiety. So the, 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 talking about it being about, you know, talking about this being about focusing on the good. I also, yeah, I'm, I'm challenging myself to reconsider what is good and what's bad in terms of my experience and actually to value all experiences equally and all feelings equally um, when I'm able to experience them fully, you know? Yes. So true. So true. Um, and and yeah, like just this whole idea that like we have, uh, I mean, it's back to the basic, I don't know what ancient tradition it's from, maybe Buddhist, but just of assigning either good or bad to things and how we totally pollute our experience, not only by the assignment of good or bad, but then by our language about whatever it is, right? And mm -hmm. I was saying this the other day in a, a totally little tangent here, 
Um, but my daughter, she's two and a half and she's really into helping like with everything, all the things, right? She wants help with laundry. She wants help with cooking. She wants help with dishes. And I'm sitting there watching her and she's watching me make tea. And of course she can't help with all the tea because it's a bit hot, but she's so like for her, this experience of making tea is just like the most interesting, joyous, <laughs> exciting. And I'm like, when did I start to label this as a chore? You know, when, yeah. did it, when did it go from just an exploration and an experience and a, a you know, a treat to a chore? Mm -hmm. And um, same with even the dishes, like, because we call it a chore, but for her, like, oh my gosh, mm. doing dishes is just like, please, can you put me in the <laughs> My brother, <laughs> my brother is like, he's, he's a, he's kind of a dedicated hedonist, but like completely okay with it. Like he's a DJ and has done all, all the things, but um, he actually, he's recently written a novel. He, he basically, I'll just tell, tell the story. He had a, a bout of meningitis this time last year and almost died and coming out of the coma in which he had been placed so that they could operate on his inner ear and save his life. One of the first things he said to me was, you know what? I think I'm done with drinking. Life is too short. I have too much I want to do. He has gone back to drinking, but in a much more moderate way. Um, but then he also, you know, he started work on a novel and basically wrote a novel last year, which is amazing and has revealed this incredible latent talent for writing. Um, I'm helping him try and find a publisher at the moment. But anyway, he's, he's already talking about his second book <laughs> and it's called Zen and the Art of Washing Up. Because he's the same. He's like, why do people, why are people so down on washing up? It's a great way to meditate. It's really, you feel really productive. You've achieved something. And it's like, again, and I think that's what you know, having a naked mind is about, right? It's about deconditioning and deprogramming our minds from all these external ideas about what is a exciting experience, what is a good experience, what is painful, what is productive, you know, and actually really getting back almost to our factory settings and giving ourselves permission to decide for ourselves what, what we want to engage in and why. Yeah, absolutely. It's so true. And I, I think that's it. It's like, okay, what, what were we born with, you know, came out of the womb naked? What were we born with and what have we added? And what yeah. is of those things that we've added with what's serving us and what's not serving us? Right? Exactly. And what's actually somebody else's Yeah. that we're yeah. what somebody else's experience well. or someone else's ideas that we're just kind of playing along with. And that's one reason I love astrology, which so often gets a bad rep for being really flaky and woo woo. I use astrology as a essentially a tool for self-awareness and self-analysis because when you can understand to read your own birth chart you can see exactly what you came in with and you can see exactly where you've been conditioned and where you've been maybe knocked off what is your path um and with that information you can yeah reclaim so much of your agency when it comes to the life choices that you're making yeah that's 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 just so true um so as we finish up, I have two questions for the end of our time together. And the first is, where can people find you? Where are all the places that they can? Well, as much as I have a very conflicted relationship with social media, <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to addiction, particularly dopamine, um, the role that dopamine plays in addiction, um, I am on Instagram at Ruby Warrington. <laughs> Um, and I also have my own podcast, the Sober Curious podcast. So people could go find that on Stitcher, Spotify, and iTunes. They can listen to our our other interview as well if they like this one um and then yeah the book sober curious is out it's uh paper, paperbacks coming out beginning of next year um there's an audio book as well which people seem to like so that's kind of where i'm mainly at i'm in brooklyn though i'm based in brooklyn they might literally find me walking around the streets of brooklyn <laughs> yeah, very, i had a good time living in brooklyn um it's yeah, cool it's a very good time yeah it's beautiful very cool. So let me follow up with the, the question that I always ask sort of at the end, which is, you know, if you could go back in time to Ruby, who was coming off the Kundalini retreat or, you know, Ruby, who was <laughs> Bridget Jonesing it with her media career and monogamous relationship and just tell her about <laughs> what life is like these days, you know, what would you tell her? Whoa, that's a tricky one. I would tell her, I would tell her that it really is on her. If she wants to make a change, if there's anything she's not satisfied, then it's on her to make that change. And that she has all of the tools and all of the support that she needs to do that. You know, things don't just change. We have to take action. 
And I'm so grateful that, you know, I, I began to take my own action in terms of actually questioning the drinking culture that I kind of like come up into. But I'm also grateful that the universe kind of gave me a nudge and helped me move to America because honestly, I think um, I've, my experience of, of living in America has really helped me to, yeah, open my mind to feel like more accepted about who I am. It's been a very expansive experience for me. So but yeah, not without a lot of, of action and risk taking and leaning into discomfort on my own part. <laughs> That's so cool. and so true. and so important. I mean, we have to just get okay with that. The sooner we get okay with discomfort, the sooner everything. Exactly. And it's, for me, it's not even about getting, it's about getting okay with it, but in the realization that actually discomfort is necessary when we're changing. Discomfort is necessary when we're changing or evolving in any way. Just look at anything in nature. I often think about like how the intense discomfort that a shoot of a new plant must feel when it's bursting out of a seed, like that must be so painful, (laughs) you know? And yet we have to, we have to expand. We have to, to, we almost have to like, yeah, break us up, break ourselves apart a little in order to grow. Well, we even think, we always think, oh, the discomfort of childbirth from the perspective mm. of the mom, but what about the perspective of the baby? Totally. I think about that often. <laughs> that must be so like just petrifying. Right. And yeah. Everything's changing and you don't understand it. And, um, and there's no stopping it. Yeah. And they come out crying. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And they come out crying on purpose because if they didn't, they wouldn't be breathing. So it's like amazing. Right. But yes, it's so, exactly. It's not only, yeah, not only okay with it, but really necessary like that. Necessary. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's such a pleasure. Such a joy. Thank you so much, Ruby. Um, Thank you. And yeah, just, it's awesome. I love your story. Thank you for having me. Let me ask you a question. What is better than change? (laughs) Lasting change, of course. And if you've had trouble making change stick, either with alcohol or in any other area of your life, you are in for a treat. I created the 100 Days of Lasting Change to ensure that we don't just change for a moment, but we truly transform for a lifetime. And this program is so close to my heart. Thousands of people have been through it and their results are incredible. But don't take my word for it. Check it out at thisnakedmind.com forward slash 100 days. And as always, rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast as it truly helps the message reach somebody who might need to hear it today.